Thanks a lot, Barry. Um, so some of you have seen some of this material, but I've supplemented it with a bit from the, the, the recent floods. And also looking at some of the, the research and development work that I've been doing over the past few years with ICL and Amiga Sciences as well. So we'll be taking a look at Japanese knotweed, some of the ecology and the background to, to why certain methods work, why certain methods don't. Having a look at the evidence that uh, Advanced Invasives and Swansea University in, in partnership with Complete Weed Control have developed over the years and take a look at how we can best manage Japanese knotweed, particularly um, at the landscape scale. In terms of advanced invasives, in short, we solve invasive species problems. And we're, today we're going to focus on R&D and also some of the work that we've been doing in terms of strategy, continuing professional development, and also some of our public guidance work. In terms of who we are, um, advanced invasives is the consulting offer. Um, AI Lab is our research and development offer. Offer, and all of this is based on the PhD field trial um, that I conducted with Swansea University uh, in partnership with Complete Weed Control. In terms of what we've done, um, our research is is quite unique in the sense that it's not anecdotal and it's been published in the the peer review uh, literature. And in 2018, we got the the main evidence base out, which is an ongoing uh, R and D field testing program. Um, principally based down in South Wales. In terms of Japanese knotweed, there's a misconception that we're talking about one species. We're actually talking about a group of four species um, that, are com that are referred to as Japanese knotweed sensulator, so in the broader sense. So you've got your main Japanese knotweed, which is by far the most common in the UK, a dwarf variety, giant knotweed, and also bohemian hybrid knotweed. In terms of what they look like, um, they're all quite similar in appearance, um, but there are differences, subtle differences in things like height and also the, the, the way that they spread to a certain extent. You can see at the left there, um, your sort of standard Japanese knotweed, which you find most frequently. The dwarf variety is at the top left. The giant knotweed is at the top right, and you can see the, um, the, the hybrid knotweed down at the bottom. Um, that you can see in the right hand corner there. In terms of what Japanese knotweed um, looks like above ground, it looks quite superficially similar, but what links all of these species together is the rhizome that you can see a cross section of at left. If you do want to discriminate between the different knotweed species, you, you look for, for differences in, in stem patination and height, and um, also flower structure and, and the timing of flowering, and also, crucially, the shape of the leaves and also structures that you can find on those leaves. But really, what it all comes down to is, is the rhizome system. And this is Japanese knotweed rhizome exposed by the recent flooding at the Taft's well site. And just to give you a bit of scale on this image, this is about um, 1.5 to, to 2 metres in depth. And it's really, really extensive. So when you're talking about managing it, either complete excavation or, or using herbicides, there's a lot of biomass there that you've either got to remediate or, or manage using those herbicides. Just to give you an idea of how well distributed these, these invasive knotweeds are throughout the UK, you can see Japanese knotweed at left there, which is, is very, very um, well distributed throughout both, both the UK and Ireland. The giant knotweed is less well distributed throughout the UK, and this is an artifact of the fact that it wasn't as widely planted as, as Japanese knotweed. And then you've also got the hybrid knotweed, which is quite sporadic throughout the UK. In terms of Japanese knotweed, um, considering it doesn't, well, it sets seed, but they don't germinate frequently in the UK, it's continuing to spread its range throughout the UK. And this is um, obviously a concern, but it's also quite interesting the fact that it's spreading so widely throughout the UK, principally by vegetative clonal dispersal, either through fragments of the root system, the rhizome, or the stems and the leaves occasionally. In terms of the, 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 the kind of um, propagules or, or, or units of dispersal, you can see it right, some rhizome sections that are really quite small. And it only takes a few years for those to develop, accumulate biomass to become the, the, the large 
um, crown structures that you can see at the left of the image there. There's a lot of information going around about what is the minimum size for um, viable size for, for knotweed uh, rhizome to produce a new plant. And this is some recent research um, from Canada where they've actually been germinating fragments as little as 0.02 grams. And these are producing viable plants. And clearly when you think about um, excavation or dispersal by flood water, it, it really doesn't take a lot of this rhizome material to produce a new plant. In terms of the way that Japanese knotweed is dispersed in the UK, um, it's, as I said, it's principally vegetative. And in these images, you can see how people have moved um, Japanese knotweed around and likely spread it. So at left, you can see either deliberate or accidental fly tipping of Japanese knotweed material in, in Cardiff. And to the right Im in the right images, you can see where kids have been playing in the park and there's rhizome material attached to the stems. Now, in both cases, this is going to result in production of new plants where, where conditions permit. The other key route of dispersal is via floodwaters. Now, I'm using the recent flooding in Cardiff as a good example of this. Um, you can see here that there was really, it was unprecedented, the flooding in, in South Wales earlier this year. And you, you can just see by the, 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 the river levels here that there's going to be a significant amount of energy in that flood water. It's going to be dislodging Japanese knotweed and, and carrying that material downstream. These images are taken from the Taft's well site. Um, you can see at left just how high this flood water was. Uh, the, the river is actually still in spate um, during, during the time that I was, I was capturing these images. And you can see that the debris is maybe two to three meters above that, that spate level. So this, it, was, it was really high. Uh, there was a lot of energy carrying material downstream. And I think the image at the top left there that you can see where um, the bank's been scoured, um, it's, it's clear that, that, that there's going to be a lot of material that's been moved downstream by those flood waters. At the top right image there, you can see how material has been dis deposited over the, um, the field trial site. And again, the, the kind of energy in that flood water. And it's interesting to note at that time of year, normally you'd see a lot of dead canes um, and above ground material left over from preceding growing seasons. And that's absent. I took an image from the South Wales um, media and I put that at the bottom and there was a lot of discussion around how much debris was ending up in Cardiff Bay, which is a number of miles downstream from the site. And I would argue that 95% of that debris in, in that flood water that's been carried down by that flood water is actually Japanese knotweed stems. So it, it illustrates not only um, the dispersal of the Japanese knotweed by, by the flood water, but just how much Japanese knotweed is grown along the banks of the River Taff and, and the other river systems in, in the Cardiff area. I took these images over the last couple of weeks and it's kind of a follow up to, to where that Japanese knotweed has effectively gone. At left, you can see a new knotweed that's arrived in the new uh, beach area that's been created at the field trial site by the, by the recent flooding. You can see a rhizome crown at the top left where um, Further upstream, knotweed's been dislodged, brought down to the site. Uh, at the top right, you can see some windrows that are formed in a, in a local park where the floodwaters um, came over the flood defences. And at the bottom right, you can see where that, um, that silty soil, um, Japanese knotweed material and, and flood debris is actually producing new Japanese knotweed plants. So it's it the recent flooding will will certainly have exacerbated the problem definitely in south wales in terms of the problems that japanese knotweed causes there's a range of ecological issues um and there's a lot of legislation that's sprung up around around the plant and management of that plant in terms of the the way of viewing this legislation it's probably easiest to summarize it in terms of five key perspectives and you can see those at the left there so you've got a biodiversity threat Waste is a controlled substance, um, so that's to minimise um, people moving around Japanese knotweed material. There's also the issue of control in residential areas. Japanese knotweed has a direct impact on property value, so there's, there's an element of, of legislation created around that. In terms of enforcement of strategic control, because Japanese knotweed is so widespread, it's infrequently going to be um, uh, legislated against under those species control orders. 
but there's also restrictions on the herbicides that you can use and where you can use them that are principally um, under the um, under EU legislation at present. I think in terms of the legislation and understanding it, this, this site of the headwaters of the River Rumney really kind of summarises um, the issues around Japanese knotweed. This image was taken in 1984 and there's no Japanese knotweed present at this site at that time. Fast forward to 2012 and there's a lot of Japanese knotweed at the site now. The knotweed was imported during uh, flood defence works in the 1990s and subsequently has probably well, there's been some mismanagement at the site, but it's spread widely throughout that site. Now, this underlines why there were restrictions placed on the movement of contaminated not or soil contaminated with Japanese knotweed. It also emphasizes how Japanese knotweed has direct impact on ecosystems through shading out native plant species. There's a lot of leaf litter inputs into the stream that also impacts on native species. But it also highlights, I mean, how would you remediate, eradicate Japanese knotweed at a site like this using physical methods, but also even using chemicals, uh, herbicides, it's going to be very difficult to access the steep banks and application in, in settings like this is going to be very challenging. In terms of why I focused on Japanese knotweed and why complete weed control were keen to get involved in the project, there's a lot of money being spent on Japanese knotweed, its management, and the economic costs of Japanese knotweed in their totality are much greater than all other invasive plants in the UK combined. It was interesting when I started the PhD that the best practice was quite wide in its recommendations. Um, you can see where the state of play was um, in terms of the, the management recommendations, physical management um, recommendations. Um, when I started and what I've done with this table is highlighted those methods that anecdotally um, appeared either unlikely to work or I had evidence that they didn't work and those methods highlighted in green there was some suggestion that those could improve um, control and management of knotweed so in terms of the ones that we didn't trial were things like cutting pulling and burning and um, the methods that we did try were things like reducing uh, knotweed height prior to herbicide application, complete covering using geomembrane, and rhizome tillage or excavation prior to herbicide application. We didn't have um, the time or resources to, to take a look at complete eradication or remediation of Japanese knotweed. Just taking a look at some um, examples of, of methods that we didn't test, this is a site in, in South Wales that was mowed repeatedly. You can see that on the left. And every week um, management was undertaken, but you've just got a regrowth of Japanese knotweed. So I mean, the, the, the number of mowing um, applications that you would require through a growing season just to keep on top of it are gonna be completely unsustainable for large scale management and, and unlikely to work. In terms of burning, Japanese knotweed can grow up to, to over 3,000 metres on the side of Mount Fuji, which is an active volcano. So, I mean, in terms of burning Japanese knotweed, it's unlikely to work. And you can see it left where this has been attempted, and you can see the regrowth at the right. And it is, it's relatively unscathed by that. In terms of the chemical management, again, coming back to where things were when I started my research, glyphosate and um looked quite quite likely to affect Japanese knotweed control and anecdotally we were getting some good reports in terms of their efficacy. 2,4-D and triclopyr alone um, didn't appear to produce very good control results or certainly long-term uh, control results for Japanese knotweed. It's interesting to note here as well that the time of application is quite wide um, and it's also interesting to note that in the time that it's taken to get my PhD results out and published Piclorum has already been deregulated from use. So it's, although we're still following up on the experiments, we can't actually use that in the EU anymore. In terms of this kind of wide uh, recommendation for different active ingredients and often um, conflicting uh, accounts of whether they work, people start to take things into their own hands. And in this particular case, um, a company in Cardiff were managing the Japanese knotweed through stem injection. Of, of diesel oil. Now that didn't work and the knotweed was regrowing. 
There's also examples of mismanagement using things like glyphosate. And in this particular case, um, a property owner had noticed Japanese knotweed growing nearby to um, a, a patio. They drilled through it and poured glyphosate into the hole. Now, it's quite easy to understand that with no guidance or limited guidance and conflicting accounts of what works, people begin to take things into their own hands. It's less understandable, perhaps, when uh, statutory bodies are doing quite similar things. So this is a site in Cardiff that I noticed in late 2017. And I'd seen Japanese knotweed growing there before. And I'd noticed during the winter months that the stems had been trashed. Um, and I, I hadn't seen previous treatment. When I got a little bit closer to the stands, I noticed that the Japanese knotweed had been broken down, that track machinery had done it, and it had been the, the knotweed material had been ground into, into the surface. When I came back in the following season, it had been treated again, this time using herbicides very early in the season. And it didn't take long to work out that the knotweed had been treated using asynthetic autumn, we're not quite clear on that, at a very, very high application rate. Indeed, the application rate is so high that it's actually burnt the grass. You know, synthetic organs are meant to be selective um, for broadleaf species. I think importantly as well was the fact that they've not, or there was a leak coming from the, the application equipment. So there's a number of different issues around this application. Um, and I think most importantly is that it doesn't work. Um, so there's a lot of time, money, and effort gone into managing that knotweed. And in, in late 2018, you've got a complete recovery of Japanese knotweed. So it's, it's, it's effectively a lot of wasted time and money gone into this management process. Just taking a look at this from the air, um, this is 2001, and you've got quite sporadic, quite limited Japanese knotweed stands. And following successive years of mismanagement, you can see here how those knotweed stands have expanded and, and created in, well, further problems in the landscape. So in terms of where things were, where things are moving towards, when I started the PhD studies, there was quite a limited evidence base around Japanese knotweed management. And it, there was an over, well, there was a lot of focus on industry case studies that were often quite short term in, in, in their overview. Over the years, there's been a lot of academic um, research undertaken in terms of Japanese knotweed management, particularly um, over the last two to three years with, with Swansea University and complete weed control studies and also the University of Leeds and ACOM. In terms of the government and trade body response to, to Japanese knotweed management, it's principally focused on the work, academic work of Child in 1999 and Child and Wade, which produced, well, was the, the kind of bedrock for the Environment Agency best practice in 2006. And over the years, uh, trade bodies have developed on this and, and there is a better understanding of Japanese knotweed and control and management of this species being developed over time. Fundamentally, though, underpinning these, these best practices, there needs to be good evidence. And the over-reliance on anecdotal rather than systematic evidence has, has hampered management of Japanese knotweed. The duration of these studies needs to be extended as well. Um, in terms of single-year testing, a lot of products and methods, so for example, cutting look quite effective in, in managing above ground growth, but are we managing the rise and below ground? And I think crucially as well, scale is important. You've got methods that might work for residential properties, such as complete excavation. These can't be scaled to the strategic level, but also in terms of the data quality. When we're looking at um, management of Japanese knotweed, scale is really important. These are long lived perennial species. They've got extensive rhizome systems. So looking at very small plot sizes really doesn't give you an indication of whether that control method is gonna work at, at larger spatial scales. And I think really, when, when you take a look at where things were 10, 12 years ago, this limited guidance and, and an anecdotal um, um, data set underpinning this resulted in an industry folklore developing around Japanese knotweed and a lack of clarity in terms of best practice management for these species. So this is where 
the uh, Japanese knotweed trials um, that I undertook with, with Swansea and, and complete weed control came in. And what we're really looking at is integrated weed management. We're trying to test all of the available methods for Japanese knotweed management and see which worked. And, you know, also uh, take a real look at which are not only um, effective, but economically and environmentally sustainable as well. So looking at the cultural, preventative or physical methods, um, we, we avoided cutting without herbicide application, but we also looked at rhizome tillage prior to herbicide application. We didn't test the biological control agents, but we had a full range of, of chemical control methods um, and, and applied them using a full range of application methods available at the time. And in terms of the integrated weed management systems, we looked at integrating different methods and also looked at the, the application timing in terms of the overall um, development of a best practice for Japanese knotweed. In terms of the trials themselves, uh, between 2011 and 2018, there was a minimum estimated project cost of around 1.2 million pounds. So these are quite extensive trials. In fact, they're the world's largest Japanese knotweed trial and one of the largest and longest running invasive species management trials uh, worldwide. When I started the testing, uh, there were three field trial sites set across South Wales with a main five hectare, 12 acre site in, in, in Taswell near Cardiff. And in terms of the publication that came out in 20, 2018, we were looking at 19 commercially viable um, test treatments tested in triplicate and these were evaluated in 225 square meter treatment plots. So we were looking at 58 225 square meter uh, plots over a number of years. So we were, we were capturing that, that long-term data at sufficient um, uh, spatial aerial scales. So that, that was fundamental to our testing approach. Just to give you a brief overview of what these sites look like, um, the Swansea sites um, that you can see at left there, those were subject to physical treatments and, and physical with herbicide. And then the Taft's well site was where we conducted the majority of our experiments. So these were integrated methods, herbicide-based methods, um, and ultimately the Taft's well site is, is quite unique in, a, in allowing us to test that number of treatments and for that, that, that amount of time. Just taking a quick look at the, the, the invasive research centre, the Taft's Well site, you can see it left there in 2012, just as we were getting going with the treatments. And you can see over successive years how, how the landscape has effectively changed as the knotweed's been controlled and managed. In terms of the integrated weed management testing approach, you've got the, the physical methods, so we were looking at geomembrane covering. Chemical control looked at soil and foliar spray application of a wide range of, of herbicide products. So we were looking at actually six herbicide products, seven herbicide active ingredients, covering four groups of herbicides. So it was very comprehensive in that respect. Also, we were looking at cut and fill application method and also the stem injection method. In terms of the integration of treatments, we looked at rhizome tillage and also cutting prior to herbicide application late in the growing season. Quickly, the herbicides covered four groups. So we were looking at Shikara, Digital, Glyphos Proactive, Depitox, Cinero, and also Tordon. Now these have been added to over the years, but this was what we published on. So even this subset of what we're discussing is, is quite comprehensive in itself. Because of the scale of the testing, it was actually staggered. So we began treatments at the Swansea sites in 2011, and we, we, we initiated treatment at the Taft's Well site in 2012. So it's quite complex stats to make sure that all of these sites matched up over time. In terms of the testing approach itself, spatial extent is really important in terms of knotweed. So not only with the plots, they were 15 by 15 meters, so two, 225 square meters in total, but within those, we were actually looking at six subplots, which were four meters squared. So it took into account any variability in testing because often um, you get quite patchy responses um, with respect to Japanese knotweed testing, and that's a result of differing um, density of rhizome below ground. What we were 
doing effectively through the experiments is matching what we understood about the biology and ecology of Japanese knotweed with the, the different methods um, that we were testing. But really, fundamentally, what we're looking at is, is Japanese knotweed rhizome being um, like a rechargeable battery. And year after year, energy is added to that battery. It's a long-term store of energy. And this is what allows Japanese knotweed to grow early in the season, close the canopy gap, and shade out other native species. And what we did was break down the, the growth stages of Japanese knotweed through the growing season. So in stage one, you've got um, rhizome pushing up energy which allows knotweed to grow early in the season. Stage two is where Japanese knotweed begins to capture energy above ground and uses that for further above ground growth. And then from stage three onwards, it begins to draw down that energy captured in that growing season and, and store it down in the rhizome system. So in stage one, we are looking to, to completely stop Japanese knotweed growth through the growing season. Stage two was using um, other methods to deplete um, the energy captured in the growing season, whereas in stage three and stage four, we were looking to apply glyphosate-based herbicides that are strongly translocated down into the root system late in the season. So in terms of the key ideas, looking at strong seasonal changes in energy flows, the rhizome biomass as well, one of these questions that we were also asking is, is dose important? So if we apply more herbicide, do we get better control results? Also, deep rhizome is a long way from your point of application. If above ground growth is two meters above ground and the rhizome's four or more meters below ground, how do you get that herbicide from, um, you know, to travel over six meters? So there's a lot of questions involved in, in the testing approach that we took. Interestingly, we found that doing more with less is, is what, we, what we can do with Japanese knotweed. And, and this applies to a lot of other invasive plants as well. Over application, um, repeat physical treatments don't produce better results than, than using the right stuff at the right time. And, and this has important consequences in terms of environmental and economic sustainability of treatment. So the key findings were that rhizomes can't be depleted even over extended timeframes. And we, we found this with the geomembrane covering. Even after three years, above ground growth indicators like uh, stem density, crown density, with no difference to the control plot. Um, so you can imagine that that has had light cut off for three years. So things like mowing is just not going to work, certainly within decadal timescales. Integrating treatments doesn't improve knotweed control. So cutting prior to herbicide application actually reduces the efficacy of glyphosate application because what you're doing is cutting off the, the above ground pump that pushes down glyphosate into the below, below ground rhizome. So integrating physical treatments with herbicide doesn't improve control. It was interesting that when we coupled um, this push down into the below ground tissues late in the growing season, glyphosate worked much, much better than any of the other treatments tested. Two applications of glyphosate and stem injection work comparably. These are the best treatments. Um, annual foliar spray is also highly effective. These three treatments form an outgroup relative to all other control treatments. They're, they're by far the best. Now, in terms of how you should view this, two applications of foliar spray is better, be, means better coverage over the knotweed stand. Stem injection is injecting each individual stem, so you're getting very good coverage of, of the, the knotweed above ground growth, and that means that you get good translocation down into below ground tissues. The key difference is, is that stem injection uses 15 times more herbicide. So you've got to consider this within your overall treatment strategy. Um, you know, you're gonna get good results with, with any foliar spray application, but also thinking about you know, is it going to be sustainable from an economic standpoint to manage Japanese knotweed with two foliar sprays as opposed to one? Well, the, the benefit isn't twice as good results, and you've got to consider your labor costs within that program. It's interesting, or certainly interesting from an ecological standpoint, beyond the threshold dose, higher doses don't improve glyphosate um, efficacy for, for the control of Japanese knotweed. So over-application of herbicide isn't going to get you better results. And I think really importantly is that 
we're not talking, certainly with larger patches of Japanese knotweed, we're not talking about eradication using glyphosate-based herbicides. It's long-term control and management, and I think this is an important um, thing to note, and certainly when you're discussing this with clients. In, ter in terms of sustainable control management, timing is critical. Using the right herbicide, glyphosate, at the wrong time early in season won't produce good control results. When I'm talking about coverage, this is getting enough herbicide onto each of the growing points or stems in order to affect long-term control in subsequent growing seasons. Now, in terms of coverage, we're looking at maybe getting a few leaves per plant and when you're using foliar application. When you're using stem injection, you should be treating each of those stems um, sequentially. Thinking about threshold doses, stick to the label rate. Um, over application um, to one stem won't reduce um, above ground growth in, in nearby um, stems. So don't over apply herbicide. And I think within all of this, you know, this produces better long lasting control results over time. In terms of your herbicide applications, particularly foliar methods, you've got to think about some other issues as well. Rainfall is, is key, um, certainly in the west of the UK, and also water hardness in the east of the UK. You want to make each of your foliar herbicide applications count. Um, if, if the herbicide application is washed off, that's going to result in, in a waste of labour. Um, and certainly in terms of the hard water issues that in the southeast of the UK, if you're getting your herbicide um, uh, bound up by, by metal ions that are present in the water, you can reduce glyphosate efficacy. So you've got to make every application count. So in terms of maximizing uptake, certainly with foliar methods, operator performance is key. Ensuring that you get that good coverage over a few leaves on each stem within that stand, that means that you get very good control results. In terms of making sure that that product stays on the leaf long enough that it's absorbed, I'd always recommend the use of adjuvants as well. And certainly this is what we found in the testing with ICL and Amiga Sciences. I think one of the things that's quite often overlooked is wart conditioners to improve absorption or the available availability of glyphosate in the spray solution. And that's another consideration that you should be thinking about in terms of managing Japanese knotweed. It's worth noting that certain products are inbuilt with adjuvants and water conditioners. So things like Roundup Pro Vantage um, are really good in terms of um, ease of use and, and also in terms of the way that the glyphosate is absorbed into the Japanese knotweed plant. When you think that really your labor cost is going to be the largest component of the treatment program, using the right tools for, for the job at the right time are going to really improve um, not only your economic sustainability, but also the environmental sustainability by reducing the treatment life cycle. In terms of surfactants that are available on, on in the market at the moment, and I would always recommend these, particularly when using generic formulations of, of glyphosate. Um, in terms of using uh, Speedway Total and also Top Film, these are actually recommended on the ProVantage label for, for managing specific species. So in the case of Speedway, this is a replacement for, for mixture B, and this should be used with, with things like rhododendron, with thick waxy uh, cuticle, which minimizes herbicide absorption. And then top film was actually the product that I used in my field trials, and this should be used um, for, for the management of aquatic species. So to summarize all of this really, um, use the right product, glyphosate, at the right time late in the season, and really use the right tools for the job, where you've got products that incorporate um, uh, adjuvants or water conditioners that improve the likely, likelihood of getting good control results. Really, those are quite marginal costs in the context of a, a, a long-term Japanese knotweed management strategy. It's really important to use um, good application procedures, but also maximize the value of, of each application using those, those methods. I think in terms of managing Japanese knotweed, be really careful about over application of glyphosate. It's not going to improve your control results relative to following the label instructions and, and getting good coverage of each of the knotweed stems. And I think from, it's, it's from a legal perspective as well, don't over promise. Ensure that your client knows what they're getting, and that's effective control and management. 
and not eradication, certainly using glyphosate based herbicides. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dan, um, and thank you for everyone that's attended this. Um, just to reiterate what Dan said in his uh, closing slide presentation, um, it's or it's very much key to, um, I think Dan will agree, to manage your clients' expectations, be aware of the environment that you're working in, um, the water you're using, and using water and conditioners and adjuvants when needed. Um, and over replying, like you said, uh, it doesn't really get you anywhere, um, particularly in the climate we're facing with Roundup being very much under the cosh at the minute, being seen to overapply is probably the wrong way to go things. So it's using the knowledge and the tools available to you uh, to the best of your ability and using resources like yourself and what we have available, should you have any questions to be able to do that. Um, okay, what we've had, we've had some very, very good questions in. Um, what we'll do is work through these in order. Any we don't cover, I apologize now. We will follow up all of these uh, later on. We've had a couple of questions about the presentation and the video with whether or not this will be shared online. We are looking at the best platform in order to do this. Um, and once we finalize the platform, we're gonna do it. Um, we will share this and let everyone that's been attended and registered uh, know about this and how best to access the information. So um, if Dan, if you're quite happy to get tested on your information, we shall <laughs> begin and fire away. So let, let's see what you really know. Okay, so a couple of questions. Um, Japanese knotweeds appears to be far more densely uh, distributed in Ireland. Uh, is there a reason for this? Is it, is it just environmental conditions? What's your thoughts? The distribution of um, Japanese knotweed in Ireland, it's, it's a bit of an artifact of the map. Um, it's been more frequently observed recently and the colour pattern in the map makes it look like there's more knotweed in Ireland. I think it's because it's only over the last 30 years that it's been reported more widely. Um, the UK, um, without sounding dismissive about it, has got quite a long history of biological record keeping and I think that's reflected in those distribution maps. Okay, they thank you. The colour scheme that, that, that kind of gives that impression rather than the actual distribution. It's distributed very, very widely in both in both the UK and Ireland. Brilliant, thank you. Um, are there any particular soil conditions where the knotweed um, grows more prominently than anywhere else? Well, just to give you two examples, um, at the Taft's Well site, it's a really nice um, dark soil, high organic content, well-drained, um, always well supplied with water. Um, it grows really well there. But then again, our PhD student, um, co-supervisor with Complete Weed Control, um, she recently found um, Japanese knotweed growing vigorously in sand. So I, I, I've, I've yet to find a substrate where it doesn't grow well. Clearly, if you've got, um, particularly in sites where you've had capping of material, um, compaction of material, the roots don't go quite as deep. Um, the biomass can't accumulate in the same way but it's still going to be vigorous above ground. Okay, you mentioned Taff Wells, so we've got a couple of questions specific to that. Um, what was the time taken to stem inject the plots at Taff Wells? Um, my average, because you've got differences in stem density access. I mean, obviously not what you're going to get out on a brownfield site with glass and barbed wire and everything else there. But you were looking at an application time of around half an hour for 225 square meters of Japanese knotweed using foliar application, so one application. For stem injection, I was looking at between about, I think it was about two and a half hours and three and three and a half hours. So it's it's significantly longer. And I think this is one of my contentions with these methods. Two foliar applications gives you better cover or equivalent coverage to what you get with stem injection so you get really good control results with that because you're treating every single one of those growing points inevitably with one application you're going to miss a couple of growing points and that's where the difference is between your two foliar applications one mid-season one late season and your single application in in late season um but You've got to consider, I mean, the only real time that I'd recommend stem injection is where you've got inclement weather um, or you've only got a handful of stems and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be carting uh, spray equipment through someone's house, for example. 
Okay, uh, still on TAF wells, you mentioned GlyphSate having to translocate over or up to six metres to reach distal parts of the rhizome network. Did you measure rhizome extension in your study, as this figure suggests that four metre or so is typical at TAF wells? No. Um, what I can report, though, is glyphosate doesn't move far in the knotweed plant. Um, without going into published work that's ongoing. Um, this comes back to this issue of glyphosate dose. So if glyphosate moved really well within the knotweed plant, things like cut and fill would work really well because, so just to give you an equivalent dose here, um, it's 3.6 kilograms acid equivalent um, of glyphosate um, per hectare for a single foliar application, certainly with what I applied. With the cut and fill treatment, we we're using 85.12 kilograms acid equivalent. So it's a huge amount of glyphosate that we were using. And cut and fill work didn't work as well as um, a single foliar application. Now that tells you that the glyphosate isn't moving very far laterally, sideways, but it also tells you that the, the glyphosate isn't really moving very far or deep into the rhizome either. Um, so what I can report is that it's it's about knocking out those surface buds of knotweed. It's not about poisoning the entirety of that rhizome. That might happen in, in very small patches or where um, the soil isn't very deep, you may be able to kill it, um, but I wouldn't count on it. And I certainly wouldn't promise that that would be the outcome. Um, so we haven't measured that, um, but based on our results, and certainly it's indicated in, in the published research that we, we, we released in 2018, it doesn't move far within the plant. Um, is there anywhere or is there a central repository where we should be reporting any growth of knotweed or any invasive species? Is there a collective that can be yeah. checked? So there's NBN Gateway, um, and I, I'm quite happy to, to put some resources together on this. Um, MBN Gateway, uh, there's Botanical Society of the British Isles. There used to be an app called Plant Tracker, but I, I, as I understand it, that's been closed. There's also a group at Centre for Ecology and Hydrology that are um, certainly looking at identification of knotweed. I'm not 100% certain if they're also looking at um, record keeping, looking at where it's spread. OK, thank you. Um, are there any new best practice guidelines being drawn up? And if so, when will they be available? I've published two information leaflets for Welsh Government and they're in the review process at present. And I'm hoping that once they've been translated into Welsh, those will be will be in the public domain, certainly by the start of the knotweed season. OK, just scrolling through the questions. Thank you very much. We've got a few more to go and we've got a little bit of time left. Um, so um, we've got a question here. Having undertaken the relevant uh, PA qualifications and the PCA tech course, the time of treatment was covered, but I've recently been told that through various groups that stem injection should only be carried out in year one. Could you elaborate on this uh, with uh, any issues behind bonsai growth? Right, so this is actually, it's a really good question because I've, I've kind of said stem injection, but stem injection really is only relevant to the first year of treatment. And certainly when I started the work, um, there's a misconception that you're using, um, it's, it's, it's a more environmentally um, sound application method, but realistically, um, in that first year of treatment, that's the only one where you're gonna be using stem injection. In subsequent years, and the bonsai regrowth, the stems aren't often aren't wide enough to accept the injection needle, so you can't treat it using stem injection. So you'll you'll have to use a foliar application to do that. In terms of, I think there's another question in there, and it's something that has come up frequently in discussions with with uh, people in the industry and and academics is how well does the knotweed plant absorb um, glyphosate um, following bonsai once once you get that kind of regrowth that's deformed um i don't think there's really any answer to it um i think there's value in in thinking about it in terms of allowing that growth to recover so that you can treat it effectively and um, when it's got a full leaf surface but the way that i viewed it as an experiment is that 
if I see anything on that pot, I've got to carry on treating it. So that would be something that would be interesting to test at a later date. Um, but in terms of my treatment approach, I've just, as soon as I see knotweed, I treat it um, well at the right time. But yeah, it's, it, it, there's value in, 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 in both, in looking at it in both ways. Sorry, do you have any comments to make on biological control? Um, I don't want to come across negatively with this. Um, they've been working on the project a very long time. Um, there's nothing being released in terms of peer-reviewed journal articles to suggest that it works or it doesn't. Um, I understand that they're undertaking uh, testing now in the Netherlands, but from what I've seen from social media, um, as I understand it, the psyllid isn't overwintering in the UK, um, and I, I, it's, it's, it's difficult to tell um, whether, whether that would be a long-term control approach, really, and it, it's certainly not going to be useful for those of us that have Japanese knotweed in our back garden. It's not going to be um, controlling the above-ground growth to the extent that um, it isn't an issue anymore, and, and it's certainly not going to be removing the rhizome. So, um, Obviously, there's a hope there that it would work, and certainly it would be useful at the landscape scale. But certainly, from a property perspective, um, it's you know there's no proven efficacy, and I'm not sure that that will be what we'd be looking for in the longer term, anyway. Okay. Um, question here: There seems to be a number of mechanical means of removal available, uh, some of which involve riddling. These often carry guarantees of. Uh, effectiveness. However, it would seem unlikely that these may be as effective as given um, due to re regeneration of plants with a rhizome weight of 0 0.02. Do you agree? I think I think within that question, there's a bit of an answer there, isn't there? Um, you know, I'd, I've never independently assessed uh, those methods and I wouldn't want to be negative about their application. Um, there's, there's a valid reason that those those methods have been suggested or developed you know to minimize off-site disposal of waste but ultimately yeah there's there's a limitation there in the size of the rhizome fragments that can produce a viable new plant um it's it's very challenging and i mean i think all physical remediation or eradication processes are challenging um, uh, there's there's no two ways about that Okay, I know um, and appreciate you've covered this already, but we've been asked a question, so it's probably just worth reiterating. Would you recommend using a sickening agent or avagent uh, with glyphosate and or possibly a humid acid to aid the weed killer efficacy? So, so that last bit again, please, Barry. So um, would you recommend using a sickening agent with glyphosate or possibly a humid acid to aid the weed killer's effectiveness? I haven't. The, the humectant... Please go back I... to speedway comment earlier on yeah i mean speedway is recommended on the pro so just looking at this so from a um, an application perspective you've got products with inbuilt water conditioners and surfactants um those contractors and people that i know that treat large areas you don't want to be mucking around on site it's a couple of bottles instead of multiple bottles I would err towards using those from a practical point of view. Um, there's no mucking around, you've got less waste. Um, it's, it's just a clear way of doing things when you're out on site. There's circumstances, um, if you're, the, the, the glyphosate itself is the cheapest part of your control program. And I, I think there's an argument to say that you should be using good quality glyphosate for difficult to control weeds like Japanese knotweed. I mean, I, I think there's, there's some truth in that. If you do go along the route of using um, a generic glyphosate formulation, um, certainly use a good quality surfactant with that because it, that, the, the new formulations of glyphosate generic formulations, they don't have taloamine in them. They don't have a good penetrant in that, in that formulation. You need them to stick on that leaf and, and the, the, the adjuvant is there to make sure that it, um, there's an added um, benefit in terms of rain fastness. In terms of humectants, other additions, um, I would definitely recommend water conditioners. I've not dealt with humectants. 
I definitely recommend water conditions. I used Easy Mix for my winter heliotrope trial. Um, it's not a product recommendation, but it's a good product. Um, and certainly in the southeast, I'll be using that. Um, and then in terms of the adjuvants, you need to be using, it's, it's recommended on the ProVantage label, even with its factant system. You need to use um, a Speedway, a product similar or Speedway um, to get that to stick on the leaves and, and to get through that thick waxy cuticle. In aquatic settings, you're looking at top film, even with the ProVantage product. Right, thank you. Just a couple questions in the time remaining. Uh, what are your thoughts on the management of secondary weed invasion um, that commonly follows successful not weed control? Um, <laughs> I was thinking of it. Um, it's a nightmare. Um, yeah, uh, the, the Himalayan balsam that came in after the uh, Japanese knotweed management, it took about two or three years to film five, five hectares of, of, of previously invaded uh, land. So managing the, the secondary invasion of balsam was, was a real challenge. We've now got Canadian goldenrod coming in there. You know, these are quite common complications um, following management of your primary invasive plant. In terms of managing those, I think there's, there's a lack of understanding, particularly from um, stakeholders, um, that once you get rid of that primary invasive, there's then going to have to be secondary follow-up uh, with these other invasive plants. And I think generally there needs to be a better understanding that management of invasive plants doesn't necessarily need to be focused on that, um, or it should include the primary invasive plant, but also subsequent years of treatment for those other invasives as well. Okay, and finally, just before we end, um, Dan, what would you recommend um, your herbicide of choice and program length on a site with knotweed? I'm assuming it's not a straight answer, but I'll let you go with that one. <sighs> If I was traveling a long way from home, um, I'd go with something with inbuilt surfactant. Um, so you would be going with, with the Roundup Pro Vantage. If you were nearer to home, um, Dakar Pro is pretty good. It's got high loading. Um, I would be inclined to, to put my own um, surfactant adjuvant in there as well. Um, but it's large bags. Um, you can dispose of the waste easily as well. So it's different horses for, for different courses. Um, and I suppose, you know, you've got to think about how much man knotweed you're managing. Um, it's a few stems, different products have different advantages. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think my, my take home message would be, have a look at the product. It's, it's going to be relatively speaking, one of the, the a small component of your overall treatment costs, particularly over a long period of time. Get the get the timing right, get the product right, and you're going to get that job done a lot quicker. But use okay. guys with sides late in season. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, right, that's it for time that we've allocated for this. Thank you for everyone that's taken the time to attend. Thank you to Dan for his informative uh, presentation and answering all the questions. Apologies to everyone that we didn't get uh, to ask your questions. We will cover these off post webinar. And like I covered on earlier on, we will share the presentation, the, all the answers to all the questions that are asked, um, the ones we covered, the ones we're unfortunately unable to cover at this time. All those will be answered and they all should be shared on a platform once we uh, get the platform finalized and we'll share the link to the platform as well.